Hi, this is Shadi and before I start this video I just want to apologize for you know these last few days that I didn't upload it's because I had a jury and a thesis to present and for those of you who don't know I am an architect with a master's degree and just yesterday I earned my uh, an additional degree which allows me to have my own uh, office or own architectural business here in the country and subscribe to the order of architects and engineers so it was a cool accomplishment that I uh, I did and I'm very proud and I'm sharing the good news with you so uh, with that out of the way let's begin with the video now before I start this video I will tell you that judoka profile is not over we're still gonna be talking about tons of judokas however it's nice to go back old school once in a while because you know there was no olympics there was no igf there was no grand slam grand prix all that stuff so it's all still controversial to this day it was very chaotic uh, between you know uh, gang wars Bali tudo gracies the thing that happened with maracana i will be discussing a, in a bit so it's nice to go back old school and see that uh, even from you know, like a behavioral standpoint, uh, everything from uh, BJJ, Judo, etc. It has evolved uh, from a moral standpoint and how we treat and respect our opponents. I, the more I do research, the more I see that we have evolved a lot in you know the last 80 or so years. So it's very nice to go back old school and discuss controversies and special incidents because they can teach us a lot and appreciate what we do have now. So Masahiko Kimura was born in Kumamoto, Japan on September 10th, 1917. He started judo training when he was 9 years old by the hands of Tatsukuma Yoshijima and just 6 years into judo training he had already acquired his 4th dan or 4th degree black belt and as a teenager he was already defeating third and fourth degree black belts so he was a very special and talented judoka by the age of 18 he was already a fifth dan and he was winning all kinds of all japan tournaments and by the age of 30 he had reached the level of seventh dan and his training was extremely fanatical some would say he was training nine hours a day some say he was training you know, drilling uh, Ochikomi and uh, Nagekomi hundreds of times relentlessly. He would train his Tokuwaza, the Osotogari, uh, by a tree, doing it on a tree. And that's the kind of man he was. He was very uh, relentless. He was very uh, over there. He was really training and he was really doing what it takes to become the best. And he was truly the best, I believe, in his era. And now let's talk about Helio Gracie. So in 1949, the Gracies were still issuing the challenges. Um, their quote unquote discipline was on the rise. They were challenging Capoeira, etc. So they challenged the Japanese for a Gracie rule type judo match, which basically means there's no Nagewaza or Osaikomi. The throwings or the pins basically meant nothing. They don't advance you to win. And that's basically it because they knew judo was they relied a lot on throwing and pinning in order to get the win however they only made it so you can win by either rendering someone unconscious or they tap out so kato was the first one to volunteer so when henner gracie said that you know they challenged kimura and kimura dissed them and didn't uh, really care so he sent uh, kato that was actually not factual so Kato went there and he lost. He was uh, rendered unconscious via gi choke. And then Yamaguchi wanted uh, to go in second. However, Kimura volunteered himself to go in. And when the first round started, uh, Helio Gracie was going for, um, you know, Sotogari and Ochigari, but really and very easily. Uh, Kimura blocked them and then he went for several uh, throws he hit him with a Seonage, Uchimata, 
the Sotogari, etc. But Helio Gracie would fall very good. He had a very nice Yukemi and the ground was very well patterned. So that really did not affect the match that much. And then he decided that in the second round he's gonna go in and he's gonna take the fight to the ground to finish him off. And this is what happened. So the first clip we saw in the beginning, that was basically it. And he used the Gyaku Ude Garami, the, the shoulder lock which is now famous for his and named after him. He broke his arm and then went for it again, broke it again. And then going for it the third time, Carlson Gracie threw in the towel from the Gracie corner and Kimura was declared the winner. And on that day there was, I believe, about 20,000, not hundreds of thousands like Hannah Gracie said. And also the president of Brazil was there. So 20,000, not hundreds of thousands. And the president of Brazil was there. And interestingly enough, uh, the Gracies had a coffin laid there next to the ring, you know, kind of like a psychological scare tactic. Honestly, the, and you know, parentheses, I open like a parentheses and say like, that's so disrespectful and so immoral to pull such a thing. I mean, uh, I, I, it feels like the UFC, like now if I see the UFC and the way they behave and see this also, I would not be surprised that it was the Gracies who started the UFC. So you can kind of see the trend still going along. But when it comes to judo and courtesy, etc., it's always been the same. Here we see them doing the bow, the respect, everything. And again, you know, the, the lack of respect for Kimura and the Japanese, it was immense. Now, let's talk a little bit about his professional wrestling career. So, in the early 50s, I think that uh, Kimura found it very lucrative to go into professional wrestling, you know, like scripted wrestling, well, not as much as the WWE, but still. And there was this famous Korean professional wrestler, Ricky Dozan, and in the early 50s, they set up a series of matches between the two. And the first one, they initially planned that it would end in a draw so they could have other matches. And Ricky Dozan did not stick to it and eventually chopped Kimura on his neck, rendering him unconscious. And to top it all off, Kimura did not get a rematch, so it was very embarrassing for him. And at the same time, you know, Ricky Dozan stabbed him in the back. However, it, is, it does not end there and honestly something really horrific happened afterwards. Um, in a club in Tokyo, a nightclub in Tokyo, Ricky Dozan was assaulted by a gangster by the name of Murata that belonged in the Gokudo. If, for those of you who don't know, the Gokudo is like an organized crime organization, like a mafia if you want. So they would, they would have like these full body tattoos you know, resembling the ancient samurais, etc. And what Murata did was stab Ricky Dozan in the stomach with a uh, urine-covered knife. It's incredibly disgusting from a physical and moral standpoint. It, just imagine the horror. And a week later, obviously, Ricky Dozan died from the infection caused by that knife. So... This is what I wanted to discuss. Uh, it's this point to be exact because a lot of people um, linked this murder to Kimura himself saying that he had a hand in it, um, he knew what was going on, he set this up. There's no full proof that it happened because all we have is in his journal saying that he never forgave Ricky Dozan for this treachery. However, I'm really personally hoping that it is not true because you know someone who grew up in the dojo you know practiced won the all japan grew up with this um you know set of principles etc i'm really hoping that someone like kimura did not associate himself with you know uh, mafia and all these types of people and these you know uh, vicious killers i really hope and you know that's it but Honestly, I doubt that, you know, he had a hand in it because, first of all, I mean, it was scripted. Um, it wasn't real. Everyone knows that it's not real. It was just simply a business move, you know, to make some money. And also, you know, uh, 
I would say that Murata's, you know, motive to do this because, well, you know, I'm sure, you know, racism and intolerance had had a hand in it, and he was a big shot, and he was also Korean, so mainly that's it. And he beat their, you know, national hero, their champion. But I doubt that Kimura sent him and did this. I because you know, Murata would have confessed or something if. Kimura truly sent him to do this or he had a hand in it I believe that he would have got caught however I do doubt this and I'm not gonna lie I am biased I really don't want someone as honorable as Kimura to have a hand in this, such a disgusting and vicious murder that's simply it and honestly you know from the evidence the police investigations etc there's nothing linking him these are all just speculations so it's safe to bet that it wasn't his idea um, so this was it you know just not only talk about the Gracies and such but also there's this incident of pro wrestling uh, I found it very interesting and really intriguing you know again people would kill each other over these things back in the day not like today you know the max you'd have today is like a, the brawl of Khabib and Connor and then that's it but back then it was really vicious, you know, Hicks and Gracie going and assaulting the uh, Luta Livre and, you know, these brawls in the rings, etc. Now it has evolved quite a lot. Not in the UFC, there's still a lot of lack in courtesy in UFC, but, you know, we have it a lot easier today and, you know, we learned a lot from the past. This was Shadi and again, thank you for listening. And thank you for interacting and each comment and like. Everything really helps me a lot. Thank you all for listening and interacting with me. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. And I'm signing out.